I'll be reading from Acts 12, verses 1 through 25, if you'd like to follow along. Again, that's Acts 12, verses 1 through 25. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to fear, to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and he did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. This is the word of the Lord. Maybe you're familiar with uh, Psalm 118, uh, verse 6, where the psalmist says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side, I shall not fear. What can man do to me? And uh, when I get questions like that in the Bible, I answer them. Well, he can bully me. He could threaten me. He could uh, injure me, arrest me, smack me, interrogate me. Starve me. As we read here of James, he could even murder me. But you know what man cannot do? He cannot snatch us from the hand of Christ. He told us so. He cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the answer back. What he can do? Well, he can injure us physically. 
but he cannot injure us eternally. We forget that though, don't we? We forget because the cares of this world are great, because the temptations of this world are great. We forget that the Lord promised to never leave us or forsake us. We focus in on the prison, or we focus in on the whip, or we focus in on the threat, and we forget the Lord is a very present help in the time of trouble. We forget that His steadfast love is actually better than life, and we try to preserve our life. And what we read here in Acts chapter 12 is is some men and some of our brothers and sisters that, well, they believe the steadfast love of the Lord was better than life. And if it cost them, it cost them. Because it was only costing them temporarily, physically. But they had a great reward that was coming to them. And I'm saying as as modern day Christians, we forget these eternal promises. We focus in on the physical security that we enjoy in this world. And we give in to the temptations or the pressures or or the opposition to Jesus and the advance of his word. And that that opposition to Jesus, it may just be a family member. That is, they don't share your enthusiasm for the Lord. And so it's not an active opposition. Maybe it's just a passive, indifferent opposition. And you come home or or you share something that's so encouraging to you and you're all amped up about the things of the Lord. And they're like, eh, that hinders, doesn't it? Or at least it feels like it. Sometimes the opposition is, is a lot more sinister. And it's what's called systemic. That is, the whole system is opposed to Jesus. It could be education, it could be political, it could be media, where there's just this collective pressure to get the men and women that belong to Jesus to turn from obedience to Jesus, turn from submission to his word, to turn to the cultural values and so forth. But what we need to know is, y'all, that's just going to happen. We live in a fallen world that is, that is more likely to adore Antichrist than Christ himself. We live in a system, in a, in a culture, in a society that is devastated by sin. Decay is real. And hearts have been deceived. Men and women have believed lies. And they reject the one that is actually good and true and beautiful. Choosing instead to live for their own selfish ambitions and gratification. That necessarily is opposed to Christ and his word. So then the question that I have for me and then as an under shepherd of Christ to our church is what are we to do then? Because it's going to happen. What are we to do? And I think Acts 12, what we read here actually helps us because we have a moment in which the church broadly, but then two men in particular face serious opposition to obeying Christ in his word, to being preachers of his gospel, spreading his gospel and, and what they show the church broadly. And then, and then one of the men uh, in particular, Peter, what they show is they're actually aware of God. That is they're facing opposition and they're remembering God and the church does it through prayer. Peter does it through sleeping. Yes, you can actually honor God by sleeping. More on that later. And part of that remembering the Lord is to remember no one's greater than God. Somebody's voice may seem louder than God's right now. Somebody's threats may seem more pressing than the promises of his word, but no one's greater than God. And I hope, I hope every one of us, whether or not we know Christ this morning, I hope every one of us would at least agree with that premise. No one is greater than than God. And the world has been barked by many foolish men and women that have set their lives to prove that's not true. I hope that's none of us. But at least we could agree at the outset, no one is greater. Acts 12 is a, is a pretty incredible chapter. It's, it's dynamic. It's full of action. And I love it, if for no other reason, because God is the clear hero of Acts chapter 12. No man is boasting at the end of this. It is all of God, his glory, and his grace. Now, Acts 12 is also interesting because it's in, a, it's in a shifting moment in the book of Acts. It's in a shifting moment early in church history. That is, un, until this point, apart from chapter 11, where there was this brief moment that we turned our attention to a northern city called Antioch and the work of Christ there. And then, and then 13, everything shifts from Jerusalem to Antioch. So Luke turns our attention from Peter to Paul, from Jerusalem to Antioch, uh, because God moved the center of the mission from Jerusalem to Antioch. But how kind of God in that movement, he draws our attention back to Jerusalem one last time to say this. In, in essence, the focus may be shifting, but my love has not diminished. 
the focus may be shifting from Jerusalem to Antioch. But those people in Jerusalem that were once the center of the mission, they are still dear to me. They matter to me. And I love them. And I am with them. No one is greater than God, right? So when the opposition comes, when the threat comes, the grace from God calls out and says, remember me. Remember the Lord. He's greater. In this chapter, we have several contrasts. We see a humble follower versus an, an arrogant fool. We have the power of God that comes up against a weak king. God is exalted versus attempts at self-exaltation. When we look at the church, we see the, the apparent, and this is key, the apparent inability of God's people to do much about corruption of power. But then you actually contrast that with the actual inability of stopping God. Hallelujah. And those attempts to stop God, they're with chains and guards and gates. And God stopped this foolish king with worms. I think every little boy is like, can you tell me more how that happened? <laughs> Acts 12 is wonderful. Because the mighty man gives in to worms and God reigns supreme. It's encouraging. But we don't want to miss verses 1 through 4. There's serious opposition to God here. This is not light. This is not trivial. This is serious. And, and, and it begins with about that time Herod the king laid violent hands. And we didn't know who Herod the king is. Well, he was the, he was the grandson of the Herod that ha tried to have Jesus killed. You remember that account early in Luke's gospel where there's that call for all the boys to and under to be killed? This is Herod the king's grandfather. And, and there's a generational gap because grandfather had his own son killed. The, the, the middle Herod. Because he didn't quite get in line with the striving for power and the, the love of power. And so father had son killed and that left grandson Herod in this awkward place. And the rest of the family saw he is next. So they sent him to Rome to have him educated, if you will, to have him baptized into Roman culture. Because maybe then grandfather will appreciate some of the conniving, scheming aspects of Roman culture. He can bring that here and maybe he could live and lead in our land. Well, what happens is he befriends uh, the royal family there, the emperor's family, becomes best friends with the emperor's son, and he really gets baptized into Roman culture. So let's just say he was a flamboyant playboy who was loose in his living, and he ran up a lot of debts, he aggravated a lot of people, and one day, repo man came calling, and he ran. He ran home, and he lived in poverty. Didn't last long, because, you know, word spreads, this is the crook. And, uh, and he got arrested. He was taken back into the Roman area, thrown in jail. But, uh, you know, it's just how, like Psalm 73 says, the wicked prosper sometimes. Because his, his childhood friend became emperor. And new emperor said, Herod, my friend, you are released, not just to go live on the street, but I am setting you in charge of that homeland. Yeah, those people who sold you out, those people who turned you over, I'm going to put you in charge. That land belongs to you now. And flamboyant, reckless playboy is ruler and leader of the world. He was a, uh, of this region. He was a politician through and through, marked by murder, marked by corruption, marked by, marked by recklessness, self-absorbed living. It was all rewarded. And so maybe we would say his currency was abuse. And being a good politician, he knew what would keep the people on his side. So he may have been a neutral actor, not likely, but he knew where the people were. And this passage here even says that he laid hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him and put him into prison, delivering over the four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. He saw when he arrested James and had him killed, the people loved him. Ooh, if they love me for that catch and capture and kill, what will they do when I get Peter? But because of Jewish custom, we'll wait during the Passover. But day after Passover, it is time for him to die. 
But notice at the outset, it says that the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. These are the Joes and Janes of the church. Many were on the receiving end of violent hands for what crime? Going public with their faith. Going public, being counted among the assembled, gathered people of God. That is, they didn't stay home and say, you know, Jesus and I, we got this thing sorted out. The rest of y'all can be reckless and get arrested. They went public and it cost them. I, I, think, I, I don't think any of us probably had, in Jesus' name, violent hands laid on us this week. And it breaks my heart to think maybe we had violent hands laid on us from an abusive parent or abusive uh, spouse or whatever it may be. But their crime was they loved Jesus. And then you see right here that James, one of the first apostles, he was killed with the sword. He was literally beheaded. For what crime? He confessed Jesus as Lord, not Caesar, and his life showed it. So it wasn't an empty confession. It was a full, robust, whole of life and submission to Christ uh, uh, confession. And it cost him his head. Peter's, or, uh, uh, Herod, Herod's like, I'm on a roll. Yeah, these people love me for this. And so then you have Peter. And his intent was whenever Passover ends, he's going to follow James. He's going to follow Stephen. He's going to follow Jesus. And he will die. It's hard to underestimate. No, no, no. I said that wrong. Overestimate how serious this opposition was. So when you say systemic opposition, the whole system was against the followers of Jesus. The whole system of culture was wanted them rooted out, silenced, done with. It cost them everything to go public with the faith, to walk in obedience to Christ. I think it's important to remind us that uh, suffering that they experienced or we experience doesn't mean we've sinned against God. Doesn't mean they've done something wrong. I, in fact, there's no record in this passage or any other passage, that James or Peter did something wrong and God was punishing them now. That's why they were suffering. In fact, if you're, a, if you're thinking about it, the opposite would have been true. Humanly speaking, had they chosen to disobey God, they would have been rewarded. Go home. You're free. You can live. But Peter and James are like the man born blind in John chapter 9, where they said, Whose sin is it, Jesus, that caused this man to be born blind? Was it his sin or his parents? Do you remember what Jesus said about that man in John 9? He said, it's neither, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. John 9, 3. Why was the man born blind? So that the work of God would be manifest in that man. No sin, but power. Or just two chapters later in John chapter 11, Lazarus died. Why? Jesus said, for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through him. John eleven four. 4. I'm sorry, what, Jesus? Why was he born blind? So that you could show your glory? Yes. I'm sorry, Jesus. Why did my brother Lazarus have to be sick and die? So that you can show your glory? Yes. I'm curious. Is that a sufficient reply from Jesus for you? I will acknowledge, y'all, unless I'm human too. That's hard to digest some days. That's a big pill to swallow. That God would bring about such a life and such an experience. And that we may be on the receiving end of violent hands or a sword to be incarcerated. So that he can show his glory. But to be a useful vessel to the Lord is an incredible honor. So we can acknowledge some things are hard to swallow. Some things are hard to digest. And we need to acknowledge God's ways are mysterious, right? And They're not always peaceful or comfortable, are they? Some of you have scars because of God's ways in this world. But that's why I'm saying in these, in these moments of opposition, in these moments of sorrow and suffering, we need to remember God is greater and he's doing things that we can't yet fully comprehend. But that doesn't mean we talk back to him. It doesn't mean we, de we, we deflect and say, there's no way I can trust such a God. But no, God is in the heavens. He does all of his pleases, all that he pleases. Who are we to question back to him, to demand an answer from him? 
I guarantee you, if, if James, the brother that was, that was killed here in Acts 12, if he were to come among us today, he would give some sort of testimony that it was worth it. It was worth it because God is worth it. And some of you who have experienced profound suffering, and yes, you don't, you don't enjoy the suffering, but what you have now in Christ, you would join with James or the Apostle Peter in saying it's been worth it because he is worth it. And so some of us are suffering today. And the devil has spoken an unkind word or our own flesh, our own minds accuse us speaking an unkind word that we did something wrong and God is mad at us and that's why we're suffering. And I'm simply saying back, maybe from Acts 9 or John 9, John 11, maybe from Acts 12, God intends to show his power through you. God intends to show, showcase his glory to this world through you. So don't look at the circumstances exclusively, but fix your eyes on the resurrected king. No one is greater. So when you have this serious opposition and you see him there, that then, that then moves your heart to be ready for what I've noted as easy deliverance. Verses 5 through 19, easy deliverance. Easy means uh, effort. It doesn't mean the suffering was, was not great. But Regarding effort from the Almighty, it's not a big deal to deliver his people, at least from these things. So Herod tried to make it anything but easy. But easy it was because of God. And when we read beginning in verse 9 or verse 4 again, when we read this, notice how much security Peter had assigned to him. Like this ain't Hannibal Lecter, y'all. This is the Apostle Peter. And, and just notice the, the links that Herod and these others went to to make sure uh, Peter was secure and the gospel was going to be silenced as a follow-on. So beginning in verse 4, when he had seized him, so this is speaking of Herod seizing Peter, he put him or Peter in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So, so then the question is, uh, how did the church respond to the activities of Herod? So the man with authority is abusing his authority. He's harassing the church. He's killing now uh, uh, James and anybody else that wants to go public and so forth. How did the church respond? Notice they didn't take up arms. Remember, Peter did that in the garden, and it didn't go so well where Jesus, you know, he rebuked him. Okay? So they didn't take up arms. Notice also they didn't protest. They didn't boycott. Something we're really good at, and that's our instinct because we're Americans and we like to protest and revolt. What did they do? How did these Christians act when the government was breathing down their throat? They prayed. But it wasn't easy nonchalant, flippant prayer. It says they prayed earnestly. They prayed earnestly. And that word earnest means like wrestle. Want to wrestle? It's like wrestling with God. This is, this is like sweat. This is grabbing. This is clinging. This is pulling. This is, I'm not taking an easy answer from this. I'm not going to bed tonight. This is the type of prayer we pray when a loved one is missing. You ever had a loved one go missing? child, a, a parent, a, you know, just someone you love and, and they're just not found. This is a type of prayer we pray when a loved one is injured and the, and, the, and the paramedics show up and they're getting put into the ambulance and rushed out and maybe you follow, maybe you don't follow. So again, this isn't, yeah, Lord, give him grace. This is all of heart, all of mind, attacking the throne room of God saying, have mercy, help, protect, heal, bring home, make play, whatever it is, God. And, and, and you just keep going back to that. And your, your voice is raw and your tears have stopped flowing because now you're dry and you're just exhausted at the end of this prayer. This is what the church did when they were persecuted. There's no tweeting or Facebooking. There was no texting. There was no passive aggression to one another. It was casting everything on the Lord. It's Jacob saying, I'm not letting go. And if you dislocate my hip and I walk with a limp all the days of my life, it's worth it, God, because 
these people or this one or this whatever is so important and so dear and I am so helpless. God, you must do this work. This is very instructive for us. Because we want to protest or feel sorry for ourselves. And these brothers and sisters prayed through the night. And we learned that at least some of them were in the house of Mary. And they wrestled all night. Prayer must be our first response. Because prayer is our best response. Do you pray? Are you a man, a woman, a child of prayer? When it dawns on you, the world's broken. Things aren't as God originally designed them. Do you pray? Because That's a mark of having the spirit in you. That's a mark of knowing I can't. I can't fix this, God. Only you can. See, prayer is beautiful because it, it is the act of praying is saying, God, I'm relying upon you. God, I'm acknowledging that you are sovereign. I'm acknowledging that you are wise, that your ways are not my ways. And I have no ability to resolve any of this or understand this apart from your grace to me. God, have mercy. You know, all of those things actually honor God. So being generous and being kind, those things honor God. Praying a helpless prayer honors God because it acknowledges the one who is never, ever helpless. We have that astounding invitation in 1 Peter 5 to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Can you believe God actually cares for you? And if you're like, yeah, of course he does. You may be flirting with some like self-love right there. <laughs> the humble heart says, yeah, it still astounds me. It still astounds me that he loves me, that he's mindful of me. I, I was sharing with someone this week, the Lord deeply convicted me about a sin in my life. And maybe we'll just call it a surface level sin. And it's one of those garden variety, everybody struggles with type of sins. And so difficult to a hasty life. My confession was very brief. And then the Lord just smacked me with his love. And underneath that surface level sin, I, I'm not exaggerating when I named off 10 other sins, that had to have happened to lead me to that surface level sin. And it didn't leave me despairing. It led me to a place of gratefulness for his love. When I bring this volume of sin into your presence that you have known about the whole time, Lord, and it's just now dawning on me, and I bring that there and I lay there and I'm not condemned, but I'm loved. I'm disciplined. And I'm restored. Can you believe God loves you and cares for you? That he says, bring your cares to me precisely because I care for you. That's where they were. So they didn't necessarily give in to the inevitable, but they took it to the Lord. And, 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 and part of what, what makes this beautiful is while the church is wrestling through the night, the man that is in the crosshairs of Herod is doing something radically different than staying up all night and wrestling. Did you notice this? <laughs> this, is, this is surprising. Verse 6. I'm actually going to read through 11. 6 through 11. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping. <laughs> Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. So again, noticing the security, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. The chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real thought he was seeing a vision. And when they passed the first and the second guard, they came to an iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and of all, the Jew and of all that the Jewish people were expecting. I love 
Acts, 6, Acts 12, 6 through 11. The man of God was so aware of his circumstances with Herod, with the chains, with the, the guards, with the doors and the doors and then the gates. So aware of his circumstances, his brothers and sisters are praying. He said, peace out world, I'm going to bed. <laughs> There's nothing he could have done about his circumstances. And so one group shows that they're trusting the Lord by wrestling all night. One man shows he's trusting the Lord by not wrestling all night, but by going to bed. What would you do the night before your execution? I'd probably live with regret, just full disclosure. Oh, I'd love to see my boys one more time and tell them this and this and this. And I'd love to see Emily one more time and tell her that and apologize for that. And oh my, oh, and then the list of just, unless I thought about the Lord. And I'd say, you know, you're in control and I'm not. And you're good and I'm not. And you're wise and I'm not. So pff, doesn't make a lick of sense to me, Lord, but you're still the same. Good night. This is beautiful. That what a tender mercy from God that this man was not eaten with anxiety or regret or fear. But he slept in perfect peace. In fact, did you notice that his sleep evidently was so deep that when the angel showed up and the cell lit up, he didn't open his eyes and wake up? I mean, moms, you know, kid comes in the room, they don't have to do anything other than breathe and you hear them, right? An angel shows up, whoosh, light up the room, he is out. In fact, he was so out that it says the angel had to hit him or, or literally struck him with a violent blow. Peter. No, it's, it's like, goosh, Peter, get up. And he's so out of his mind. And he had to be told, get dressed, <laughs> get shoes on. You're not staying here. Let, so we should read this and picture a man that's half asleep, that's dazed and confused, not sure of all that's happening, so out of his mind that he's got to be told, hey, you ought to put your sandals on before we take off. Like, in other words, God's the hero. <laughs> Peter does not have the wherewithal, the mindfulness to even put his cloak on. He's not sure what's happening. Is this real? Is this a dream? In, in fact, it's only in verse 11 after he's been released, after they've passed through all these levels of security, that he came to himself fully and he gives God the glory for it. This is astounding. God is the hero. God is the one who did all this. Not Peter, not the church. This is the work of the Lord. And it's so easy for him. That Herod, these guards, they all put their best effort forward to make sure that Peter will die in the morning. And the gate opened of its own accord. Try that one on. Son, keys don't just walk out of the house. Well, maybe they do. <laughs> right? I mean, I know the gate does not have a will. But when God says gate open, he does not need a man or woman or child to open that gate. And when he says chains fall off, he doesn't need the key. He doesn't need somebody getting up wrestling. When, when, when guards also slept, evidently, like, this is God. Because an angel and a light shows up, we wake up, don't we? Unless God is working. And when chains get put on, they stay there unless God is working. And when gates are closed and locked, they stay there unless God is working. It's all so easy for God. Isaiah 40, verse 15 tells us the nations are like a drop in a bucket. The peoples or the nations of the world, they're like dust on the scales. You know what that means? They don't even register. Psalm 2, verse 4 says the Lord laughs when the nations plot and scheme against him. And we get all hot and bothered and we stay up all night and we, and we text about it and we ruin ladies' Bible study or men's Bible study when we talk about all the political activities of the world. And, ah! and he's like, that's just dust on the scale to me. What are they doing? <laughs> they, they're cute. They think they're legit. Like, 
It's also easy for God. Acts 12, man's best attempt, he laughs. And whatever it is we're facing, it's not a laughing matter per se, but it's, God's not up there like, man, I wish I could help him. Oh, my heart breaks for you. If you need anything, let me know. I may be able to help you. It's easy for him. Now, some of us may find ourselves more like James than Peter. And that belongs to the Lord. But some of us may find ourselves in prison, bound, and all we've done is focus in on what's wrong in our circumstances. And the Lord is saying, trust me and sleep and watch me work. Like you think you have this licked? Okay, keep licking then. And when you're tired of licking, go to sleep because now I'm ready to work. Aren't you glad when we sleep, God's not sleeping? <laughs> like while Peter is helpless sleeping, God is awake and he's moving. And what happens in verses 12 through 9, uh, we, we can't dive in. In fact, we can't really dive into a lot that's happening here in these in these verses, it is, is a popular, you know, like we know about it, it's actually a funny and a little bit discouraging because it hits close to our behavior uh, type of story. We, we read here that um, uh, Peter came to himself, verse 11, uh, now he's giving great, uh, glory to God uh, that the angel rescued him, and it says, when he realized all of this, verse 12, he went to the house of Mary, mother of John, whose other name was Mark, and we're going to see more about Mark in the coming chapters where many were gathered together and praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda, or maybe you should picture a little girl named Rose, because that's what her name means. So maybe a 12, hey, Layla, maybe just a little sweet girl. Everybody's inside praying, and they're doing their thing, and then of some sort, and Rose or Rhoda hears it. She goes out, and we, we see uh, that Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice in her joy. Woo! She didn't open the gate. But she ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They didn't say, go get him. They said, you are out of your mind, little girl. Stop it. But she kept insisting that it was so. And she kept saying, or, and they kept saying, it is his angel. It is his angel. It ain't Peter living, breathing, physical body. It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they, when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. In other words, they're shocked. Like, oh, God heard our prayer? We didn't think he was ever going to hear a prayer. Whoa, look, he heard our prayer. But mo so there's like commotion, verse 17. But he motioned them with his, with his hands to be silent. <laughs> Y'all lost your mind. Shh. <laughs> he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. It is likely Luke doesn't know where that other place is. It is likely Peter now lived an extended period of his life in secret. Because to go public, you're losing your head. And I'm like, I ain't testing that anymore. God delivered me once. I'm grateful for it. I can do this underground work like somebody else had their head locked. Like, we don't know. I mean, for crying out loud, when I got delivered, they laughed at me. I wonder how many of us, we pray, we pray, we pray, and we're more like the lepers that get healed that don't go back and praise the Lord than the one who said, well, it's kind of what I wanted, and you heard me, and you gave it. Hallelujah. In other words, do you pray believing, or do you pray like, ah, it's inevitable, he's going to die? We don't know what they prayed, in fairness. It could have been set him free. It could have been give him courage to die well. We don't know what they prayed. We know that they wrestled, that they prayed. And the Lord showed up, released this man, brought him to their attention, brought, brought Peter to their attention. He, he passed the news on. He went to another place. And then Herod, verse 18 and following, this is just tragic because the fool keeps flexing his muscles. But notice Peter didn't die. Others did. Now, when, a, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. God was not unjust for that. They'd aligned themselves with a, with a corrupt king and they were, they were his instruments of, of injustice and abuse. God was not unjust to kill these sentries or have these sentries put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. That is, this fool still thinks he's in charge and he can flex his muscles 
But what happens next in verses 20 and following? Justice is served. Justice is served. Verse 20, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So this is a region a little bit north. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his robes and took seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And so over and over and over as his speech wraps up, these folks are hailing him, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms. Whew. And he breathed his last. Evidently, this old boy, Herod the king, thought more highly of himself than he ought to have thought. But it kind of makes sense because he was the man that had the authority to have these Christians executed. And who's going to argue with him? I mean, these, these centuries, these soldiers followed his orders and it cost them. So evidently, they feared Herod enough to do something wicked. That's the type of authority that this man had. He had vast military support. He could withhold food during a fam famine simply because he didn't like a region of the country. Y'all want to aggravate me? Fine, you don't get dinner tonight. You know what? You don't get dinner for the next six weeks. You know what? You don't get dinner for the year. I'm keeping all the food until you learn your lesson. That's why we have this event. They're like, wait a minute. We got to go please this man. Because if nothing else, we have to eat. So he's loving this control, this power, and... Uh, we learn he actually has no power. That is, he couldn't prevent worms. He could command people. He could control food. He could use women, do whatever he wanted. But he could not stop what God was going to do. And so you, you should picture he's called for this public speech where he's going to be their hero. Fine, I've heard your, your appeals. Fine, you can have food. And evidently he was so eloquent and powerful, or maybe they were so desperate that they hailed him as a God and not as a man. And he did not say, whoa, slow down. He's like, yeah, I am. That's, I kind of like the sound of that. And immediately an angel of the Lord, and who knows, maybe it was the same angel, maybe not. An angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms. Yikes. Justice was served. And church, justice will be served against all sin. It may not be public. It may not be as gory as this. That is, we may not see it. But justice will be served for all sin. And this is in part what makes the man Christ Jesus, the son of God, the image of God in human flesh. This is in part what makes him so incredible. We know God is just and we know that justice will be served. And we come to Jesus, who was a man who had done no wrong. And he suffered as though he was the lawbreaker. He didn't suffer and die for his injustice, for his sin. But it was for your sin. It was my sin. It was the sin of all who would trust him. He bore the wrath of God, though he had earned the pleasure of God. And God is just for doing so. Because the Bible says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So that in him, we would become the righteousness of God. So God is just and the justifier of all who have faith 
in Jesus. And Romans 3 tells us that in times past, he was overlooking or passing over sin. And that meant the people would have suffered for things that they were just curious to them. As they see the wicked advance and prosper, and they try to walk by faith and honor the Lord, and they suffer and suffer and suffer. And they're like, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? And the answer is, until the fullness of time, when God would send forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. And, and, and I'm just going to acknowledge something just for a moment here. If you're not full of the Spirit this morning, I'm just doing crazy talk to you. I know that, because this is ridiculous. That somehow a, die, a man could die 2,000 years ago in your place and God would be happy with you. I know that's just wacko talk to you. But if you're full of the Spirit and, and you know, God has awakened your dead heart and you're now alive in Christ, you're like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. And I don't know exactly how that works, but it is true. And I am benefiting from it. Hallelujah. Thank you that Jesus lived and suffered and died and rose in my place. Condemned, he stood so that now with his righteousness, all I hear from God is no condemnation. So then the question we should ask when we see things in this world and when we see all the, the sufferings and all the injustice of this world, the question we should ask is when? Not if justice will be served, but when will justice be served? And here's what I mean. Because God is just and all sins will be justly punished. The answer to the question is going to be this. One. When will justice be served? It was either at the cross when Christ died for my sin. Or two, it will be on the day of judgment when God judges the living and the dead. And every single person throughout all of time and space must ask and answer that question. And I want to tell you, be careful how you answer that. So I can stand here today by grace for God's glory and I can say justice has been served for my sin because Christ my Lord died for my sin. And if you say, I don't know about that, then you've already answered it the second way. It will be, it will be served later. And I'm saying, friend, flee to Christ today because justice will be served. Aren't you glad God is holy and righteous and just? And aren't you glad when Herod rises to power or somebody else rises to power and the people of God suffer unjustly now in this world that we don't have to take up arms? We don't have to protest. We take it to the Lord in prayer. We cast our cares upon him and we say, Lord, we wish there was deliverance now, but we trust you. We wish there was justice now, but we trust you. And we know that one day you will be vindicated. And we, along with you, will be vindicated. And we trust you right now. And so we pray. We trust you right now. And so we sleep. Because you've got it. In Herod's case, well, it happened, it happened pretty quickly, I guess. But I don't know if you're the guy getting violent hands laid on you, if you would agree that it happened quickly. But we see God included us in the scriptures. He did not get off. And you know what we also see? There's no real hindrance to the work of God. Opposition does not mean hindrance. Opposition means opposition. Yeah, we're against you. But hindrance means like we've stopped you. It ain't happening. Notice what happens in the rest of this passage. Verses 24 and 25. Because Jesus shed his blood, rose from the grave, he guaranteed certain things for his people, for his kingdom. And we read in verses 24 uh, uh, and 25. But, so old Herod, down dead now, full of worms, but the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had accomplished, uh, completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. So Peter's arrest and then Peter's departure, the death of James, this is not a defeat to God. The work of God was not slowed. There is no hindrance here. The word of God is described as increasing addition and multiplying. The gospel of Jesus advanced in this moment, multiplied in this moment. The one thing Herod and the Jews were hoping to prevent couldn't be prevented. The word of God increased and multiplied. 
People weren't afraid. <gasps> James died. What's going to happen? Violent hands are laid on the Christians. <gasps> What's going to happen? People were saying, what's happening? Count me in. Jesus is wonderful. What's happening? Count me in. God have mercy on us. Because we probably would have listened to Herod. The Western church would have listened to Herod. We would have given in the threats. And here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. It says in, in, in Proverbs, Google it. The fear of man lays a snare, but he who trusts the Lord is safe. Fear of man lays a snare, but he who trusts the Lord is safe. Do you believe that? If we say we believe it, then why the gospel silence at home? Why the gospel silence in the community? Why the gospel silence at work? I mean, I know the answer. Because my life is hard already, and the last thing, I need, last thing I need is a neighbor upset with me. My life is hard already. last thing I need is lose my job. Right? I know how this works. The fear of man lays a snare, y'all. But he, the, whoever that trusts the Lord, is actually safe. You're safe. Now, you may turn out to be safe like James. You may turn out to be safe like Peter. But you're safe. And so, I think the Western church, at least many of us in this tradition, would have heard the threats of, of Herod and we're like, I'm, I've learned a lesson, I'll stay in my lane. And I'm saying, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, forever. The Spirit lives in His people the same today as He did then. And part of what Jesus died for was love of self to free us from that self-love, to free us from that need to self-protect and self-preserve? Do we believe him? Do we believe him? Enough to be a part of this word increase and multiplication at home, in the community, at work, at school, wherever it is God has us. The good news of the gospel is that, part of the good news of the gospel is that we belong to him. Like, as I said, Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. No, no one can. We belong to him. He identifies with us. And he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. He lives in us. And nothing, nothing no one can change that. I, I want to end by reading some really good news. Powerful news that I hope would stir your heart towards courage. Living in submission to the spirit of God for his glory. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Let's hear this powerful word of the Lord. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, see, some of you are already going there, and I love it. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also Give us, graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's astounding. Jesus is praying for us right now. Part of that prayer would be receive this word and live accordingly. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure. I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, this is the word of the Lord, and he who promised is faithful. Let's trust him. Father, we bow our hearts and come to you in the good, sweet, powerful name of Jesus. Full of the Holy Spirit, acknowledging you as God Almighty. You alone are God. Thank you that the nations, the dust on the scales, the drop in a bucket, compared to you. But Lord, we do come with burdens and cares that we know we ought to give to you, but we take them back, have mercy on us, and forgive us for taking them back. And then we learn from your faithful love shown to the church in Jerusalem in the midst of profound suffering. That your love is never diminished. We acknowledge, Lord, that your ways are not our ways. But that only reminds us that we lack goodness and wisdom. Because if we had perfect goodness and wisdom, your ways would be our ways. We'd be free of grumbling and fear. We would sleep better. But thank you that you are mindful that our frame is just dust. We're weak. But you're not. Thank you for the invitation to know you. The invitation to draw near to receive grace and help in the time of need. So please, Lord, as we go in the coming minutes, write these truths on our hearts. May the the spirit of the living God convict us and comfort us. Lead us in the way of truth. Your word is truth. May we remember the fear of man lays a snare, but the one and whoever trusts you is safe. So please, God, give us open eyes and open hearts to the people around us, to their true estate if they are Christless. And may we love them well at the expense of our comfort if that's what it takes. But if we're the ones cast down and despairing, Lord, please renew a right spirit within us today. We don't ask that you deliver us per se from hardship, but that you keep us. And that through the hardship, we would remain steadfast so that you will be the hero. You alone will be the hero. And God, send us out to be salt and light, to tell others your good news. You, holy and righteous, will judge sin, but you've provided a way of escape in Christ. That all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So send us out grateful that we have been blessed by this news, born again by this news, to love and tell others of this news. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. May we live a life worthy of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.